Alexei Navalny, the opposition leader whom Vladimir Putin tried to poison, has died in a Russian prison camp in a huge blow to journalism and democracy, with his death making headlines across the world. Just coming in from Russian media, they're saying that the jailed Russian opposition figure, Alexei Navalny, is dead. The prison service says Navalny felt unwell after a walk and almost immediately lost consciousness. He had never shied away from criticizing the Russian president Vladimir Putin, even from inside the prison. But remarkably, as the BBC noted, Navalny's death was not front page news in Russia. The first thing that strikes me, there's no photo of Mr Navalny anywhere. It seems to be the same on Russian TV. So how did he die? Some 11 days ago, Navalny was apparently well and joking in his prison cell. The next day, it seems, he was dead, with the Russians insisting he died of natural causes and one source calling it sudden death syndrome. But no autopsy has been performed and there were bruises to his head and chest. And however it happened, Navalny's wife, Yulia, had no doubt who was responsible. Three days ago, Vladimir Putin killed my husband, Alexei Navalny. Где-то в колонии на крайнем севере, за полярным кругом, в вечной зиме, Путин убил не просто человека Алексея Навального. Он вместе с ним захотел убить наши надежды. And even in Moscow, some of his supporters were brave enough to say the same. They finally killed him. He survived the first time, and he seemed to be untouchable. We thought they won't attempt to kill him the second time, but it turns out nothing is impossible for them. Navalny was Putin's most courageous and formidable political opponent, doing what many in the Russian media could not or would not do, which is hold Putin to account. Drawing huge crowds across the country as he campaigned against corruption, and publishing investigations on YouTube, like this one with 130 million views that revealed Putin's incredible billion-dollar Black Sea Palace. But Navalny insists that not only does this property belong to Putin, but that it was financed through corruption and the misuse of public funds. It's an entire city, or rather a kingdom. It has impregnable fences, its own harbour, guards, church, its own checkpoint, no-fly zone, and even its own border point. It is a separate state inside Russia. As the Columbia Journalism Review noted last week, Navalny was never primarily a journalist, but he undoubtedly committed important acts of journalism. Which is why he was a threat to the Kremlin and why they tried to silence him with jail, beatings and caustic chemicals on his face and tried to poison him several times, including in 2020, when they so nearly succeeded. After an emergency landing, passengers could hear Navalny wailing in pain. only to have Navalny recover and trap his poisoner in a confession broadcast on YouTube, which has been viewed 31 million times. Why? Well, I can't say why. As I understand it, we added a bit extra. So... Now we got everything, this? yes. How could you yes. do this? Yes. It was Navalny's constant use of YouTube and other social media that gave his voice such power because Russian journalists were often unable or too frightened to speak up. It was increasingly difficult for him to get the word out through um, certainly mainstream uh, media which would not talk about him. So that he found it necessary, I think, to, uh, to build his own um, outreach operation, uh, YouTube channels, Telegram channels, other social media uh, operations that have been you know, quite effective. And that was a roadmap for others to follow as Putin critic Masha Gessen explained in The New Yorker. Navalny's work spawned an entire generation of independent Russian investigative media, many of which continue working in exile. One of those, banished from its homeland, is Novaya Gazeta, which fled Russia to Latvia in 2022, and which ran two exclusive stories from sources at the Arctic jail on Navalny's death, despite Russia's concerted efforts to muzzle the publication. <laughs> How willing are sources to speak to Novaya Gazeta in Russia now? It's extremely dangerous and risky. So any collaboration with us is uh, illegal. And uh, by collaboration, I mean not just talking to us, uh, but also even reposting our articles. But in Russia, dissent of any sort is dangerous. Last week, police arrested hundreds of people who left flowers for Navalny. And Russia's most famous nightly TV host warned Alexei's wife that she will meet the same fate if she returns to Russia. Meanwhile, in the USA, as many mourned his death, Donald Trump was using it to turn the focus onto him and claim that he was America's Navalny. But it's happening in our country too. Uh, we are turning into a communist country in many ways. 
And even as Tucker Carlson was telling the New York Times how dreadful it was... It's horrifying what happened to Navalny. The whole thing is barbaric and awful. No decent person would defend it. The ex-Fox News host's interview with Putin, in which he failed to ask about Navalny, was again coming under attack. With the Russian leader branding Tucker's performance weak and telling state TV he was disappointed. Я-то, честно говоря, думал, что он как раз и будет вести себя агрессивно и будет задавать эти так называемые острые вопросы. Поэтому, откровенно говоря, полного удовольствия от этого интервью не получил. But as they say, don't try that at home. Asking tough questions in Russia is a crime, even for foreign reporters like the Wall Street Journal's Evan Gershkovich, whose detention was extended again last week by a Moscow court. He will soon have been in a Russian jail for one year and could face 20 years behind bars if convicted. That's what being a proper journalist can get you in Putin's world. What we're doing, we're headed over to, uh, I, I guess, the more VIP section, Barretts, is that what you'd say? Um, to clear customs. To clear... Mm. Have your passport mm. stuffed up. I can't wait to see what Media Watch does with this. Anyway, <laughs> so... <laughs> Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And just when you thought the media could not go any more nuts for Taylor Swift, her boyfriend came to town and sent them right over the cliff with Breakfast TV tracking his private jet all morning on Thursday as it edged closer and closer to Australia. And all the networks taking a live chopper shot of his jet as it came into land in Sydney, followed by a TV... Touchdown! touchdown. Official Young touchdown! Right. Touchdown! Kelsey! He has scored over 70 touchdowns in his NFL career. This is the greatest of all time! with even the ABC being forced reluctantly to join in the party. Yeah, there has been a bit of a controversy over uh, Taylor Swift's use of private jets, her private jet. What a spoil sport. And the networks don't just have eyes in the sky, they have reporters and cameras on the ground at the airport to bring us the breaking news. This is a live look at a fence. <laughs> <laughs> that black Mercedes, it hasn't moved the whole uh, morning. Both ways really are stuffed. If you go to the eastern distributor, it's a car park, or they can go the spaghetti interchange, which we know is a disaster. And as the country waited with bated breath to find out if it even was Taylor's boyfriend, Travis Kelsey, on the plane, the seasoned pros on breakfast TV did their best to fill the airtime. It's a big one. It's a 19-seater. We think it's worth 40 million bucks. So the stairs go out. Um, there may be there may be someone who comes on board to check oh, passports. Check passports, yeah. Um, which may mean that we're going for another 45 minutes to an hour. Um, but we're happy to stay with this story. And on and on it went, with Sunrise and Today both handing the Kelsey cam over to the morning shows to keep the commentary rolling on. You guys. Oh, there's movement. What's yeah, that? Yeah, oh, that's oh. the uh, customs guy. They've done the cleaning. They've, <laughs> they're just pre they're pressing here. Oh, yeah, oh, there's a person. And after three and a half hours of gripping TV, finally the moment we'd all been waiting for when you know who emerged. We think this is him. <laughs> there is he is. He's coming out of the plane right now. Oh, is that oh, him? Is this size moment. 18 foot? Maybe there were two hymns. <laughs> oh. oh! So oh. two men wearing baseball caps have emerged from the plane. Yes, a plot twist. And was one of them Taylor's man? Turns out nobody knew. So that could be Travis. Oh, oh no, that We've looks like couple... it could be Travis. <laughs> <laughs> that actually could be Travis. I think that's Travis. I, I feel like... Is that his brother in tow? Possibly. But no, it wasn't. <laughs> I'm feeling even more confident now that this is Travis Kelsey. Very, very excited. His backwards cap and his sporting athleisure yes. gear, I would say we are on to the right person here. But nope. That wasn't him either. And for those who want to know, the first one was the boyfriend, Travis Kelsey. The second wasn't his brother, but is called Travis too. Confused? Who cares? Well, everyone, it seems, with the whole media giving in to Taylor mania while she's been here. But it was the Telly and the Herald Sun who won first prize by putting her on a combined 28 front pages this month, along with a 12-page ultimate fan guide an eight-page souvenir concert lift-out, a build-your-own life-size Taylor Swift poster, and another 100-page souvenir edition lift-out. A case of far too much is never enough. But now, let's come back home to some good news on the Murray-Darling River. The federal government is set to spend $205 million on the first water buyback since 2020, as Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek looks to deliver on the Murray-Darling Basin plan. 
Yes, the Feds have bought back the rights to 26 gigalitres of water per year from New South Wales and Queensland, or about one twentieth of what it takes to fill Sydney Harbour, which should now flow down the Murray instead of being used for agriculture. But, according to the Australian, it's going to cost a fortune, with the paper claiming it'll work out at a mind-boggling $129 a litre, which the Australian pointed out is a... Mammoth cost! Sure is. And on ABC Adelaide, the station's breakfast hosts agreed. $129 a litre. If we're paying as much for water, well, comparatively as much for water as we are with petrol, well, something's we... going wrong there. $129 a litre for petrol? Memo to self, don't ever fill up in South Australia. But to ease the cost to taxpayers, Jules Schiller and Sonia Felthoff had a great idea. Wouldn't it just be cheaper to buy bottled water? And drive it to Mount. And to empty it in the, empty empty it it in the Murray. Murray. Absolutely. So why didn't the Commonwealth think of that? Soon the ABC's morning host David Bevan was promoting the story on air and promising to find out why. But even he smelt something fishy, telling his colleagues... I'm not convinced the Australian has actually got their figures right. The estimates, from what I can see, vary between $129 a litre and $1.29 a litre, which is a big difference. But even at $1.29 a litre, that's very expensive water. Especially if you're filling Sydney Harbour, or even a twentieth of it. But a few minutes later, Devon was able to ask an expert, the Federal Minister, who's flashing the cash. The story this morning is it's $129 a litre. Is that right? No, it's way off. It's less than a dollar a litre. They got that simple calculation way off. So what is it And then? it's less than a cent. It's about 78 hundredths of one cent. Whoops, less than a cent. So how did the Australian get it so wrong? Obviously, they're not much cop at maths. As one listener told Media Watch, a gigalitre is a billion litres and... Surely even the most innumerate person can work out that paying $205 million for 26 billion anythings is not going to cost you very much per dollar at all. And how did the Australians screw up? Essentially by turning the sum upside down and dividing into the wrong thing. That's ending up with the number of litres you get for a dollar, which is, wait for it, 129. And were the Oz and the ABC the only ones to mess up? Well, no. The National Farmers Federation used the Australian's article to attack the water buybacks in a social media post, which um, they have now deleted. And the lesson here? If it sounds too crazy to be true, it probably is. Or as Andrew said in his complaint to the station... This was a completely inaccurate article. There should be some editorial control before presenting it as fact to ABC listeners or indeed to readers of The Australian, which made the mistake in the first place. And finally, a quick update on last week's report of media bias in humanising Israeli victims of the savage war in Gaza. We had lots of love from viewers with messages like... Excellent analysis and sorely needed right now. Media Watch is a breath of unbiased air. For which many thanks. And we also had messages that weren't so complimentary, including this one, accusing our executive producer of being an... Ignorant, racist, hypocritical, biased, hateful, Trotskyist charlatan, parasitising on the taxpayer. And warning... Your last red-painted tugboat is departing for North Korea. Thanks for that one, too. And predictably, News Corp hit back on several fronts, with Sky's media show running this strapline. And the Australian having a crack at us with this headline. Media Watch's war claim? A joke. The Australian not only misrepresented our findings and glossed over its own bias in reporting, but implied that we relied entirely on research by Dr Susan Carlin for our conclusions. So, I wrote a letter to the editor to say that was completely untrue and I had explained as much to the reporter. That letter has still not been published, despite a tweet to remind them, and we have received no response. Now... I really don't care what the Australian writes, but I do think it's a problem when our national broadsheet can't deal fairly with scrutiny on such an important issue. That's all from us for tonight. You can read the letter on our website. Don't forget Media Bytes on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. And for now, until next week, goodbye. <laughs>